Ruby Kagi is well known for having some really deep, incredible technical talks. And I wanted to highlight a few that all have something in common. Um, so you might have seen some of these today, or, or maybe you saw some yesterday, or maybe you'll see some tomorrow. And the commonality that you might have noticed so far between all of these talks is that they all involve, in some way, working with CRuby. This isn't the complete set, just, just a selection of the talks from this year's conference that involve working in CRuby. And you might be sitting in one of those talks or have been sitting in one of those talks and be thinking to yourself, how can I dig into the CRuby code base? Is this something I could do too, what all these people are doing and talking about? Could I contribute to CRuby? Or maybe you learned something or you saw a snippet and you had a thought, you wanted to change something or do something differently, and you thought, how can I test something that I've learned? Yep. And so today in this talk, we're going to talk through tips and tricks for working in the CRuby code base, how you might learn a few tips for eventually being able to do something similar. Uh, I'm Gemma. If we haven't met yet, I would love to meet you at some point in the conference. Uh, I've worked, I spoke last year at Ruby Kagi about a project I was working on, which has since merged uh, to do object shapes, to implement object shapes in CRuby. And through working on that, I, I really learned how to work within the CRuby code base in a way that worked well for me. And I'm hoping to share some tips and tricks from that experience that, that you could hopefully apply to yourself. And we're going to tell this as a story of three bugs. So we'll look at three separate bugs that have been filed in CRuby, and from each one of them, we'll learn a little bit more about how the code base works and how we can work in it. In case you might not have known, uh, you can report bugs to CRuby at this URL. Um, there's, there's a thorough wiki which explains how to report the bugs. So now let's talk about our first bug. This bug was filed by one of my coworkers at Shopify, David Stosik, who is also a Tokyo local. Um, and he said array sum and enumerable sum sometimes show different behaviors. And uh, any really thorough bug description has a minimal reproduction, uh, which David has included. And just to zoom in on that and rename a few variables uh, so we can understand what, what he was saying was the bug. Uh, he has this class, which is a float wrapper. And the critical part of a float wrapper is this plus method, uh, which takes, um, which adds a float, the float within the float wrapper to anything that implements 2F uh, and then wraps it in another float wrapper. So as you can imagine, we could add together two float wrappers, uh, say with integer values 1.5 and 3.5, and we would get back a float, uh, float wrapper, sorry, with float values, with float, with float value 5.0. Uh, this plus, though, allows us also to add a float wrapper to a, a float or an integer or anything that implements 2F. So we could also uh, add a float wrapper with float value 1.5 to, say, 3.5, and similarly get back a float wrapper with float value 5. OK, so that's how this float wrapper class that David has used works. Uh, but what was he saying? What was the crux of his bug here? He was saying that array sum and enumerable sum sometimes show different behaviors. So let's look at those behaviors. This first case he described is enumerable sum, uh, which, takes, which has this array containing the element uh, seven and tries to sum a float wrapper onto that. Uh, and we get back, as would be expected, a float wrapper with float value seven. If we call array sum, though, the, this same array, um, and we pass in the same float wrapper as an argument, we get back seven, not a float wrapper containing seven which David accurately described with an emoji as an explosion. They show different behaviors. OK, so the first question David asked was, what do the docs say? And he also included this within his ticket, what, what the docs said. 
And there's something we can fix within CRuby if the docs don't reflect the behavior. That means one of two things is true. Either the docs are inaccurate, and by the way, that's a great way to contribute to CRuby. There's a whole documentation guide on how you can add more documentation or, or improve the documentation. Uh, two of my coworkers, Stan, Peter, and I, uh, actually worked on improving the documentation uh, briefly last year. The second thing that could be wrong is the behavior itself. And so let's look at the expected behavior of array sum that David was talking about. Uh, he included this snippet, which is straight from the docs. It starts with sum is init, so whatever our initial value was. In this case, a float wrapper. Then iterate over the array and add each element to the sum. Our array in this case just contained seven. And then return the sum. And if we run this, we get back the expected result, right? A float wrapper, which was not the actual behavior that we got when we, when we um, got just the number seven in response. So the docs weren't equal to the behavior. But the crux of what we want to do here is learn how can we understand what's happening, right? We can demonstrate this behavior, but how can we go behind the scenes, uh, see through another layer, and understand what's actually happening? There are two steps I want to talk about to begin with. The first is how to build Ruby locally, and the second is how to test Ruby locally. So we'll first talk about building. There are three main commands here. The first one should make sense. We want to clone the repo down. Next, we're going to want to run this autogen command, uh, which will generate our configure file. And lastly, we're going to want to configure um, CRuby. Uh, and this prefix that we're passing is going to be where we would install it if we later on run an install command. So what, what directory within our local machine. And there are some runtime flags I wanted to call out explicitly that can speed up installation or speed up our builds later on. Um, two I wanted to point to are disable install doc uh, and disable gems. So installing the documentation takes a little bit of time. And if you're not working on documentation, there's no need to do this when you build. And you can add these flags right at the end of the configure line. The second thing I wanted to talk about is environment variables for debugging. Um, so there are three here I wanted to mention. Uh, this is if you want to build Ruby in debug mode. So you're gonna, we're going to see later on in this talk what that means but you're going to want another set of tools that allow you um, to use all the debug capabilities. Uh, so the first is debug flags, uh, which sets the debugging options for the compiler. Dash G generates debugging information, which we'll see later on will be useful when using a debugger like GDB to debug the Ruby interpreter. Uh, the opt flags set the optimization level for the compiler. So dash O zero disables optimizations, which can make debugging easier and compilation faster, but it may result in slightly slower execution. It, it actually almost always will, right? Because you're going to have all these assertions and, and debugs enabled. Um, and this last flag sets the preprocessor options for the compiler. So dash D Ruby debug equals one defines the Ruby debug macro. Um, with a value of one, and this enables additional debugging features or checks within the source code. Uh, so those are, those are the commands we'll run um, to build. Uh, when would you want to set those flags? Um, sorry, those environment variables. So you also want to set them within that configure line. So for example, uh, if you're setting debug flags, you would do it uh, right um, as you configure. And one tip I want to share here is it can be pretty helpful to use separate build directories with different configurations. So you can imagine that at the same time, you might want to keep a debug build around, a, um, a non-debug build around, a widget build around. Um, and all three of these, anything with the build prefix is going to get git ignored. So you can do this in separate directories. I'll explain how now. Um, right between that autogen and configure step, uh, you can make a new directory, or perhaps you already have it, cd into it, and then run the configure within that directory to keep all of the builds isolated from each other. 
you might also want to change where you're installing different versions, right? So if you're installing Ruby uh, no debug, say, and you want to be explicit about that, you could do that, or Ruby widget, or something like that. Okay, so what actually happens uh, when we're building Ruby? There's something I want to talk about here, which is, you might have heard of this, we'll have Ruby itself, and we'll also have mini Ruby available to us. And what are the differences? As the name mini Ruby implies, mini Ruby is much more minimal and, and lightweight. Um, it doesn't have the standard library and it doesn't have some other features, which altogether makes for a much faster build time and quicker cycles when you're debugging. So if you don't need the standard library, it, it's, it can be really beneficial to just use mini Ruby. Uh, in contrast, as you might expect, Ruby is full featured and, and has all of this stuff. So it takes a little longer to build um, and can be a little uh, uh, less time intensive to, or more time intensive to iterate on, um, but will have those standard libraries and a few other things. Okay, so what's the command to actually build Ruby? Well, for Ruby, it's make dash J. The dash J uh, allows us to do it in parallel. For mini Ruby, it's make mini Ruby dash J. And so now we've talked a bit about how to build Ruby locally. Um, let's go into how to test Ruby locally. So again, looking at both Ruby and mini Ruby. Uh, the Ruby test suite is in the test directory, and the mini Ruby test suite is in the bootstrap test directory. To run Ruby tests, uh, we run make test all dash J. In this case, we actually have to pass a number to Jash J. Uh, the number we pass tells it how many processes to run on. Uh, usually, we can just use dash J to parallelize, but for test all, we need to specify so the test runner knows because it can infer this. Um, optimally, the number of processes should be slightly more than the number of cores. And B test, we can't parallelize, so we run uh, make B test to, to run just the mini Ruby, those lighter weight tests. And then we can also specify specific tests or specific uh, files containing or folders containing um, many tests uh, using the test environment variable or the btest one for mini Ruby. So these are great and, and obviously as you're debugging, it can be really helpful to add uh, more test files or more, um, more cases to any test suite that already exists. But something you might actually wanna do that we'll wanna do in the case of the bug David filed is run a local test file. So uh, David kindly gave us this whole snippet already. We can just save it directly into a file at test.rb, which gets git ignored, and all of the make commands are set up to reference this file directly. Uh, so for instance, to run this file uh, with Ruby, we, we use make run Ruby, with mini Ruby, make run. And so let's do that, right? We talked about how we wanna use mini Ruby in this case. And if we call make run as expected, as we learned earlier, in the uh, enumerable sum case, we'll get the expected result, but in the array sum case, we'll get 7.0. Okay, so, so that's great, right? We can run this test file using our local Ruby, but the next thing we'll wanna do is find the appropriate functions, right? Figure out where, where this is actually happening so we know how we can fix it, or how we can even look into fixing it. And the thing we're really looking for here is where array sum lives, right? That's what we think is broken in some way and what we're gonna wanna look at. The C Ruby code base has many, many, many lines of code and it can be a behemoth to search through even using grep. Um, so there are a few things I wanted to call out specifically here. Uh, one is this RB define prefix, which has many functions that follow it and, and all of them are, as the name implies, definitions. So for instance, there's RB define method, which we'll use in a second here. RB define singleton method, class, module, module function, and, and many, many more. And all of these take as arguments um, strings uh, to point to whatever they're referencing, right? So if we're looking for, say, the sum method, um, this will take as an argument the string sum, uh, RB define method will. And so a tip here is, to look for a specific function, we can grep for the method name in quotes, right? Something like sum in quotes is gonna have way fewer appearances than just something like sum. Uh, so if we grep for sum in quotes, indeed, the first two things we'll see here 
are exactly what we want. These define method calls um, for array sum and for enumerable sum. And the third argument in both these cases is pointing directly to the function we're looking for. So the C function that's going to um, have this code. So RB, ARI sum, I'm never sure how to pronounce that, or enum sum are the two ones. Another tip is to look for an uh, appropriate .c file. Um, in many, many cases, uh, whatever you're looking into will have a .c file right in the, in the root directory, definitely all of the objects. Uh, just to briefly demonstrate this, if we ls.c in Ruby root, um, we'll get all of these, including the file that we're clearly after, array.c in this case. Uh, so this is how we can find uh, the function we're looking for. And then what we're going to want to do is use that for debugging. Earlier today, I was in Stan Lowe's talk um, about building a mini Ruby debugger. And he had this slide, which I shamelessly asked him for directly. He was talking about how debuggers work at different levels of the stack. Uh, and what we're going to focus on today, which is different than what his talk was about, is this bottom layer, right? We're, we're looking at C Ruby itself. And so, like Stan described, the two debuggers we can use here are GDB and LLDB. Uh, so let's look into debugging with LLDB. Um, so to, to run our test file uh, with LLDB using Ruby, we can run make LLDB Ruby. And with mini Ruby, it's similarly make LLDB. And the GDB commands mirror those. So let's get started. Uh, we want to run our test file within mini Ruby under LLDB. And um, we'll get a little output and then uh, an LLDB prompt. And there are a few things uh, we're going to want to learn about LLDB to be able to do this. The first is about breakpoints. So we know we're going to want to break on um, that RB ARI sum method, right? So, so the first thing we know here is B will list all breakpoints. B file colon line will allow us to uh, break at a certain file and line number. So for example, if we knew what we wanted to break on was at array.c1234, we could do this. And what we'll use here is a B function name. So in this case, we know our function name is RB ARI sum. Uh, so we could break directly on RB ARI sum right here. Um, and so if we send that breakpoint, uh, the next thing we're going to want to do is run um, the, the file. Uh, and these LLD prompts, I think, are, are quite straightforward. There's R for run, C for continue to go to the next breakpoint, N for the directly next instruction, S to step into a method. So in this case, we're going to want R for run. And we'll see it'll break right at our RB ARI sum. Um, and what we're looking for here is the return, right? We want to see what it's returning, because we know that wasn't what we're expecting. Um, so I'm just, instead of copying a bunch of code onto the screen over and over, uh, we're going to do a few next, and eventually we'll end up at this return line. It's returning double two num, which is going to um, return a number of some f value, right? And so right away, we can see that's our issue. We didn't want a number back in this case. We wanted a float wrapper. And one of my other colleagues, Jean, has since fixed this bug. Um, and he said almost exactly this, right? Don't enter the fast path. Don't do this thing if the initial value isn't a native numeric type. Um, if, it's not, if it's not native numeric, go to the slow path. Don't do this fast, uh, fast path, which is going to lead us right into the double two num call. Uh, and this was the bulk of the change, uh, which checks if something is not a number. Uh, it calls a go to this bottom slow path down here. OK, so that was the first bug we were looking at. Now for the second one. This one says expecting system stack error, but crashing. This was actually a bug in uh, some code I wrote about object shapes. That wasn't the part I wanted to call out specifically. The, call I wanted to, the part I wanted to call out was the crashing. So what does this mean, and, and how will this look different under LLDB? This uh, bug report, thankfully, similarly had a, an example here that we could use. And we know by now just put right into our test RB file. 
if we run make LLDB now, if we call run, it'll take us directly to the crash. So we'll see the process will stop on the crash. There are a few more LLDB prompts we'll want to learn to be able to handle this case. Uh, the first is BT to show us the backtrace. Um, we can also pass number of frames as an argument here. So if we call, for instance, BT7, it'll only show us seven frames um, in the backtrace. Uh, so let's do that. Next thing we're going to want to learn is if we want to go to a specific frame, uh, we can call F number, and it'll jump us right to that frame. So F5, for instance, will take us to frame five from that list. Um, and we can see, like, like I said, it has to do with object shapes here, and there was a bug. This assertion uh, was returning false. So something interesting about assertions, too, is you, they're only called in debug mode if debug mode is enabled. So this person who filed this bug was running Ruby with debug mode enabled, and therefore this assertion was where he was breaking. Uh, the last two LLDB prompts here are up and down, which will take us up a frame or down a frame, respectively. Something else which can be helpful is um, LLDB helpers that are defined in Miss LLDB C Ruby. And these are Ruby specific helpers. Uh, and the one I think is really helpful is RP will print Ruby objects. So say you had some integer two, an uh, integer name two, which had the value, the number two. In LLDB, if you just printed that integer, you would get something which wouldn't really make sense. Uh, but if you called RP on it, you would get the Ruby value, uh, which in this case is two, and much more helpful for the purpose of debugging. You can imagine how with even more complicated objects, uh, it would be even more helpful. Another tip here is to use RB bug if you're continually running LLDB and you won't want to keep moving past the point where uh, you're stopping because RB bug will just lead you directly to that point. You won't have to keep setting the breakpoints over and over again. Some of us don't like debuggers. I totally understand that. One tip if you're a puts debugger that I find really helpful is copying this line or, or the gist of it uh, wherever you're gonna put something. So maybe puts your information and then this line using the under, underscore, underscore file and underscore underscore line um, will allow you to print out something like array C1298, uh, say, um, if that's where, you're, where, where this line was. Uh, and then you can copy the same line in a bunch of different places and still clearly find where it was. Um, so that was what I really wanted to go into about, about the crash itself, right? If you're dealing with a crash, it's a, a bit of a separate case and how we can use RB bug effectively. Um, there's one more bug I want to talk about here. Uh, and this is this bug, um, support IPv4 mapped IPv6 addresses in IP adder private. Okay, so we see it has to do with IP adder and we see we're talking specifically about uh, the method private. So if we use our technique from earlier to search for the method in quotes, we see nothing related to IP adder, okay. Let's try just search for the name private without quotes. We get back, interestingly, a Ruby file with what's clearly a Ruby method definition. And if we look at what's going on here, this is what we're gonna wanna change, right, to, to fix this uh, bug. But something I wanted to explicitly mention is that this is in the lib directory. And Things within the lib directory are a little different um, than what's elsewhere in the Ruby code base. Uh, there's this wiki page, or sorry, this documentation page about making changes to standard libraries. And as it explains to us, anything within the lib uh, directory is mirrored from a different repo. Um, so if you wanna, and it's, it's a standard library. If you wanna make a change to something within the lib directory. You don't do it within Ruby Ruby itself, but you do it within that separate repo under whatever um, maintainer or contribution policy is applied to that repo. Uh, and there's one tip here. Um, this actually has to do with, with more than just this talk, but I really like this redirect as a way to redirect um, to a gems repository. 
It uses the gems metadata, which I think is quite smart, uh, gem.wtf, and then if you pass it a gem name, it'll take you directly from something like IRB to where that code lives. Uh, so in our case, if we were interested at looking at IP adder, for instance, and we didn't know where that repo was, we could use gem.wtf uh, to find where the IP adder repo existed. So that concludes our story of three bugs, which hopefully have given more of a sense of how to, how to develop within CRuby. And if you're interested in learning more, I find these documents to be really helpful in terms of describing how to contribute to CRuby, how to make changes, how to build, how to test, and so on. I've also included here a blog series that my colleague Peter wrote um, about uh, C extensions, which is also helpful as you learn to contribute. Thank you so much for having me.